You're listening to Secret Sonics, a podcast exploring the creative side of music production. Hi, and welcome back to Secret Sonics. I am your host, Ben Wallach. My guest today is Jonathan Friedlander. Jonathan is a music producer and recording slash mix engineer based out of Jerusalem, Israel, originally from Atlanta, Georgia. His credits include Nisim Black, Omri Moore, J. Cole, Big Sean, and many more. Jonathan graduated from Atlanta Institute of Music's Modern Recording Engineering and Production Program and later served as an in-house engineer at the Tree Sound Studios before moving to Israel. He has Pro Tools certification and he strives to make quality music with the best artists and musicians in the business. He currently has a recording studio in the city center of Jerusalem. I've been lucky enough to collaborate with John on a few occasions and he always serves the music and the artists he works with with a super professional approach. He also happens to live around the corner from my studio so we bump into each other here and again and it's always a pleasure for me to schmooze with him. So here's another Schmooze, and <laughs> welcome to the podcast, Jonathan. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. So tell us a bit about how you got started getting involved in music production. I got involved with music production through my engineering background. I came up as a, I came up through an internship, which became a recording engineering situation where I was engineering for a lot of different artists and being in the, in the studio with different producers and getting to see what their workflows are and kind of to be the technician that enables them to, to see their visions through in a lot of instances. So it kind of came to, to being in music production kind of by fluke, because in today's modern times, most people are looking for a music producer. When they go look for a studio, they look for a music producer. Yeah. Even though, you know, technically they, they might be booking an engineer, but they expect from the engineer to play the role of producer also in, in our modern day. So through my background as a recording engineer and, and then as a mix engineer, I have the ability to know how to find the sounds and to know how to create the sounds and to know not just, you know, okay, creating the sounds and capturing them from the recording standpoint, but where they're supposed to get to in the mix stage. So it helps to make certain tonal decisions in the production process already, certain arrangement decisions. And it's pretty natural to sort of find how things fit in into a song like these two parts yeah. clash each other they don't and how to create movement and interest and dynamics and that, and just over years through through recording many many people and mixing many songs mm-hmm. I, i've developed that ability and and now a lot of people you know will come to me for my recording studio but at the same time with the expectation of producing yeah a track so a hundred percent it's the modern way yeah we wear a lot of hats too yeah. many sometimes. Yeah, that is definitely true. Was there a song or album that really opened your mind to the possibilities of what could be accomplished with production? There's definitely songs that, that create an emotional impact with me sonically when I hear them. From different standpoints, I could take like Portugal the Man's new album and say like sonically that's like, you know, that's just every song hits on, on such a good level and everything just feels so well arranged and so well recorded and produced and everything sounds like five stars and that creates a certain emotion with me. And, and I really, I really connect to that. But at the same time, mm-hmm. I pull up the Lumineers album yeah, um, and there's a certain rawness to it and an emotion that they captured. And that's sometimes the hardest thing is the producer is to try to capture the emotion yeah. and the, the raw feeling of, of, of the piece of work that the, that the artist has. Yeah. Um, so from those two different standpoints, you know, and everywhere in between, I, I find I don't have a favorite genre even of what I like to listen to in my free time because music is very emotional for me. Yeah. So what, wherever I'm at in my day or in my emotion or what my vibe is, I'll put uh-huh. on something that will relate to that. Amazing. So what do you look for in an artist when you're trying to see if it will be a good fit working together? I kind of got this vibe from my a person who I, I look a lot up to, Paul Diaz, the owner of the recording studio I came up from in Atlanta, Tree Sound Studios. He mm-hmm. he uh, was always trying to enable young artists to be able to get their their, art, their music out there and done. And, and whatever he could do to help the people, as long as their vibe was good and their energy was good, they didn't have to be the best in the world or have to prove that they're virtuoso or anything. They, they he, he would just enable them. So I kind of have that similar perspective if a person comes to me with with an idea or a song Mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter what the budget is actually at the end of the day it matters that we could try to make something happen for them even if they have next to no money we might not get you know this uh hollywood level you know cinematic production but we'll we'll capture your song and we'll we'll do it to the best that that we can and it's interesting because I had something similar a few weeks ago. We had an artist come with a song he wrote on acoustic guitar and he would sing it. And 
it was pretty formatted okay and it was very catchy and this kid would sing and he has a, a beautiful tone to his voice like a yeah. kind of like very much something you would hear and say like was that sounds like radio yeah and it's not often you hear something you say that sounds like radio no. at least israeli radio so it was cool to get to work with the kid but at the end of the day you know budget would only allow us to have one full day of production and we worked really hard to do as much of the song as we could. We took two hours on a separate day to do pre-production where we recorded him singing in the, the song, and then we could sit and discuss it structurally to see... Yeah, what it, the arrangement's going to be. Exactly. And like I, I realized you know, pretty quickly that the song that he wrote was the same four chords over and over. So like the verse and the chorus and the pre-chorus and the post-chorus and everything was the same chords. Yeah. So after recording the scratch track and the, the, formatting the song and understanding really where everything sits, mm -hmm. we're able to see okay that that's a problem because I'm I'm now looking for, to create interest throughout this three and a half four minute long song. Yeah. But it's already in the first minute we've heard these chords so many times, so just to take that decision and yeah. swap some chords around and try to for create sure. a, a different vibe there. And in the end, after doing a full day of production, and we didn't really quite get the vocals done the way we wanted so we took another day and did half a day of vocals and then half a day just mixing it together and i would usually like to put put more effort yeah. into productions like this because yeah. like it has a lot of potential but at the end of the day if time and, and budget doesn't allow much more than that that we just do the best that we can and yeah and so i think that it's a good piece of work at the end if of you day. feel like the you know the artist has potential like you'll work with their budget and figure out a way to make something that has impact even if it's not all the way but you'll find something. Yeah, like um, I'm. I'm not going to turn down his project because he doesn't have the ability to see it through 100. percent Yeah. But I will try to convince them and show them the merits of, like, and that's that ended up what Digging happened. Digging in a yeah. bit more. Like, I ended up having a, a mm -hmm. discussion because this this fellow's young and it, it was all being paid for by his family. Yeah. So even at the end of the first day of production, you know, having the family come and sit down and, and showing them, look at what we did in one day. Yeah, and like, and and, and, the, and their minds were probably blown. Their right? their minds are blown, but they also had certain certain complaints, like how come we didn't do the vocals? It's a little, it's a little out of pitch here. Otherwise, well, you know, we just did a ten hour day straight, no breaks, no lunch break, nothing, and yeah. and there's a limit, and yeah, and and the, the, your your son's tired. Your son's tired. He put in a hard day work. Yeah, I think like it's worth it to give him a fresh day. Just, just yeah, to... it's interesting. Like I've 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 done this before, where I've had like a client who is you know maybe in high school or something, and so they're not really the client. The the parents are the clients because they're the one paying, yeah. but they're the artist, and it's like the executive striking, producer striking a balance between the artistry of the you know of let's say the the not quite legal age you know act. And the 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 wallets of the of the parents who are paying is a very difficult uh, balance to strike. I yeah. found, especially when they don't have any background in in understanding what exactly because the kid the things. kid is the one that you know understands what music is, and the parents are just you know that's a, that's a tough situation. Even outside of that, like the kid just to have the experience of recording his song and to have. Yeah. Any sort of copy of it that sounds better than a bedroom. Yeah, that's a mind blowing experience. Like, yeah, that's yeah. that's that, he had a good time and that that could that could change his life. You mm -hmm. know, next thing you know, he's like buying Ableton <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. Amazing. So, so what do you listen for the first time you hear a song? And I could add to that question if you want. Uh, do you prefer to listen to a demo or hear a live performance? At the end of the day, I don't mind hearing the person play it in front of me. Yeah, I don't mind. The, I don't like hearing songs in WhatsApp. Sometimes people send like, yeah. like they record themselves and it sounds like, like low quality. Like it's, it's hard for me to get over the sonic roadblock of, of mm -hmm. like to, to appreciate what this is musically through my phone speaker, through WhatsApp. Yeah. And, and that happens sometimes. I'd rather the person play it for me in front of me and yeah. then, and then I could at least capture a vibe or the emotion of where, where the soul of the music is. Yeah. I love like, that. Like, mm -hmm. is it, is it in his guitar playing? Maybe he's a piano player and it's his piano. Maybe it's his voice. Yeah. Maybe I could already find out that there's a problem in the song in, in that he's not singing in his natural voice because it might be an unexperienced younger artist. Yeah. That sometimes people people want to sound like the people they love and they don't embrace the, who they are. Yeah. And it comes across in in the performance. Right. Um, but always, always, I, I feel like I get the best grasp of what, what needs to happen to a song or where it's supposed to go. Once I record a scratch track on the grid, or if there's a grid, if we're working with the metronome, yeah, then I, I love to have that on the table. Like 
Yeah. It's down and then and then we could consistently relate to it and consistently say like you have a four bar pre chorus and you have a four bar post chorus. Maybe one of them should be two bars, maybe one like to start to assess these things when the person plays it in front of me. Yeah. I could make these assessments, but then when he plays it back again, he plays it a little bit different. Yeah. In most cases, unless you're talking about like a very seasoned musician, they're yeah. playing it back a little bit different every time. Yeah. And that could get confusing for especially when you start to bring in session musicians to play on. Yeah. The, so at the that overdubs. point you kind of have to take over and, you know, help guide the artist to find the right arrangement for the song. Yeah. So so what what goes into that process in terms of uh deciding what the arrangement's going to be? The structure and the arrangement. The structure I I genuinely because I, I'm I am very much about the art of it. I don't try to go and intentionally change their structure. I more listen from a perspective of if I hear something that that isn't clear, like does it have a reason for being there, or yeah, or if if just as a listener, like if if I've noticed myself as the producer listening that I'm getting bored, then the average listener was bored a long time ago. Yeah, 100%. Um, so trying to imagine like even like if I hear a certain drum thing happening in my head. Is it in your face and punchy? Is it distance? Is it, are we going for more raw vibe or like a more pop in your face? Like, uh, slamming. <laughs> yeah. These things, um, these things I, I tried to take into consideration. And sometimes, sometimes there's not a lot to work with. I've done so, a production for an artist from France named Raphael. He, uh, I produced two songs for him, two and a half. We're in the middle of the third right now that are for his album that would come out. God willing, in the year, next year or so. Mm-hmm. In the initial songs that we did, the songwriter that he brought in to for the lyrics and the and general production assistant kind of had the chords written and the structure more or less there, but there was no strumming pattern. There was just, these are the chords and this is the song. Yeah. And, and we even, which was unusual for me to work this way, we recorded the voice just on top of very basic on the ones and on the ones of each bar, the chords, yeah. and he sang the vocals. And then they all left, and they said, yeah, let's make the song. And it was kind of cool because... It's I kind of c- like remixing almost. Yeah, exactly. It was like taking an acapella and, and really... Uh, Having the freedom to do whatever you felt worked. Yeah. And it was interesting because I had to tell him at the beginning, he was he's a Hasidic singer. He sings Jewish music. and Yeah. And um, it winds up coming off very poppy and very Hasidic sometimes. Yeah. And I said, just to be clear, I'm not a Hasidic producer. I produce music from a certain standpoint of like, I want to create interest. I want to, I want to yeah. create something that the whole just, world. Just for the audience, to... if you, if you're not familiar with Hasidism, it's a branch of, it's a sect of, or there's a lot of sects within Hasidism of Judaism. Uh, you could, you could Google Hasidism, I guess. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's worth lo- a good It's lawyers. local lingo that it's, that's very obvious to us, but not, not necessarily to everyone in the, in the audience. But uh, just so you know, <laughs> it's very... as you were. <laughs> It's a very, uh, it's a, it's a genre that I don't relate to so much because I, I can never listen to the music. Yeah. Um, so to create something for an artist like this, the very first song, without knowing that we're going to do another two in the future, we did this one. I'm assuming the lyrics are, t- are like based on biblical passages. Yeah. Or something I think they like come that. from prayers. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. for the most part. So I guess I didn't have anything to do with the lyrics, lyrics or the arrangement in, in that sense. But I created the drums, the bass, uh, recorded a bunch of things, and then I presented it to them, and they loved it. And then also, like, they, they don't necessarily quite understand, you know, that this is a production before mix. Certain things, you know, yeah. will be sharpened up, and certain things, like, I, I'm when I sometimes, mix... Sometimes I, you have to preface that, right? Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. And and sometimes, you know, it's better just to, to not play them anything before it's mixed, because... Better to give them, like, a 100% polished product, and then, and then they can determine the... Uh, yeah, it's it, that's tough though because you know to do a mix properly takes a long time also. So it's like, you know, it's like how much, how far do you want to invest before you show something to somebody? Do you want to show them something that's like a hundred percent radio worthy and like have a listen and then they could decide, or do you want to like do it step by step and say like, okay, what's like the minimum viable thing I could show you that, you know, yeah. so you'll be you'll still be interested, but you know, I don't have to put all of that time in yet, you know? Totally, and I don't like I don't like to work twice. So currently I still work this way where I'd rather show the client what we got, where we're up to now and kind of explain to them where it's going. Yeah. Then go and mix the whole thing and then, and then have to make changes. Cause when I mix, it's very, there's lots and lots of layers of what's 
happening through, yeah. through the different the, processing. Yeah, we're going we're to get into that yeah. about like maybe templates and 